Well, today I sat down with the chair of the powerful United States Foreign Affairs Congressional Committee, Michael McCall, for an exclusive interview. The senior American congressman has been in Australia this week for meetings with Penny Wong, Richard Miles, and the head of our intelligence agencies, Andrew Shearer. The US is so concerned about China's increasing aggression in our region that McCall told me an American nuclear-powered submarine will be off the coast of Perth from next week. It will then move through the Pacific. McCall said this is a show of force and will act as a deterrence against China. In our exclusive interview, McCall also expressed concerns about Palestinian visas, saying security vetting is extremely difficult and any Hamas sympathiser would be a ticking time bomb. He also revealed that he had been personally speaking to Saudi officials about taking on a role in Gaza after the defeat of Hamas. And he said he was confident Donald Trump would support AUKUS if he returns to the White House. Here's that interview. Have a look. Michael McCall, great to have you here in Australia. No, thanks, Jerry. It's great to be here. You were in question time in Canberra yesterday in Parliament House. The big political issue this week has been whether there is enough security vetting of Palestinians who are coming to Australia from the war zone in Gaza. The opposition leader, Peter Dutton, has said that at this point in time, given there are no Australian officials on the ground able to do the interviews and, and the security checks, he said there shouldn't be any Palestinians coming to Australia. What, what do you think? Yeah, it was interesting to be, you know, in the parliament, <laughs> seeing my counterparts in Australia. They got a little rowdy with their questions and answer series, which I kind of enjoyed. More rowdy Watching. than in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I, and I, that, it'd be kind of fun to see that in the United yeah. States, you know, the interchange and having the prime minister on the floor taking, you know, hits from the opposition. And I can't imagine the president of the United States sitting in the well. Of and having Congress people doing that. hurl insults at him. <laughs> yeah. And then they take down the insults. And, yeah. Uh, there was Please withdraw that. Kind there of were a amusing, couple you know, to me. Yeah. Um, we always think, you know, the Brits are more civilized, but sometimes, you know, and then the Australians, but it's very rowdy. Uh, but um, to answer your question, I think, um, and I chaired the Homeland Security Committee for a long time as a federal prosecutor, counterterrorism, um, and I'm very sympathetic to the Palestinian people uh, who have been held hostage by Hamas, really. Um, we want to find a safe haven, um, but you have to properly vet individuals before you bring them in um, to your country. Otherwise, you could be bringing in, you know, ticking time bombs, um, Hamas or other terrorists that could cause uh, problems. We, in my own country, after the fall of Afghanistan, thousands of ISIS-K came out of the Bagram prisons. They went up to the Khorasan region, which is Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan. They made it all the way to the Mexican border, came up through Mexico in the United States, and eight of them are detained. Um, they also had a, had a smuggling ring, and God knows how many more in the United States, and, mm. and that worries me. And, and the most important thing, the, the, the greatest obligation of any political leader is to protect your own citizens first and foremost, to protect national security. That's, um, I think, the most um, important uh, uh, oath of any office, whether it's Congress or the Prime Minister or the President, is to protect people from outside threats. Do you think both sides of United States politics are equally as committed to AUKUS? Do you think Australians can rest assured that this will go through, that we will have nuclear-powered submarines, irrespective of whoever's in power? Yes, I, I do. And, you know, I, I made sure when the bill I passed was bipartisan, very important that we not play politics with this. One nation, one voice. Australia, I can tell you, I met with your leadership. From the top down, uh, everyone is strongly supportive. That was exciting to see. How soon do you think we'll have nuclear-powered submarines in Australia? Well, I think you're going to see rotations soon. Um, in fact, uh, the certification on Pillar 2, which is the innovation and technology, will come out in the States um, probably um, uh, later today, and you'll hear about it here tomorrow. What do you mean rotations? Uh, subs, U.S. class subs that will rotate through uh, Perth and other ports in Australia. As a show of strength to China. Showing a force. And there'll be nuclear-powered submarines. Correct.
That's incredible. So when are you expecting that to begin? Well, we've been waiting for the certification process. Uh, the um, your parliament, the Australian parliament, was required to pass export control laws, uh, which they did. I was very proud of them. And now we, we can begin because, you know, when I meet with the intelligence community, this, this thing, AUKUS, mm. this alliance between the United States, UK, and Australia, is probably the thing that keeps Chairman Xi up the most at night. It's the thing he worries about. It's, it's the thing that really scares him. And when you have that, you have deterrence. And if you have deterrence, you don't have war. And you're confident Donald Trump would be committed to AUKUS should he become president again? I do. Um, you know, the whole idea started with Secretary Pompeo. Uh, I talked to Mike Pompeo. He talked to your director of national intelligence about this idea. So it's really an extension of something that started uh, under the Trump administration. Turning to U.S. politics domestically, uh, you've been outspoken about the security flaws that led to the attempted assass assassination on Donald Trump. How concerned are you about the fact that a shooter was able to be on the roof, people saw him, and action wasn't taken in time, he was able to fire off shots, and yeah. there was a near miss? No, Sherry, I went out to the site right after. So for one of the first members to go up on the rooftop, very close. I mean, it, it's closer than that is to us. Yeah. And uh, a sniper, it's an easy shot. Uh, thank God he missed. Um, but he, he was too close. He should never have been there. Uh, I think Secret Service made some fundamental mistakes. Uh, but it all goes back to the leadership within Secret Service and also the communications with the, the local police uh, on the ground. I, I think it was a anytime you have an attempted assassination, that is by definition a failure. And I think that was a failure. Do you think there's still a lot we don't know about what exactly unfolded on that day? I mean, we know a lot more about the individual, uh, a deranged individual. I, again, he was, for a 20-year-old, pretty smart. I mean, he had a drone that he, uh, three days earlier, got an aerial surveillance map of the place. He, he walked around, scouted it out, uh, very methodical. Um, I think he was startled when the local police officer uh, climbed up on the roof and he fired a shot maybe uh, too hastily for him. And that probably saved the president's life. Yeah, unbelievable. We've seen this, uh, we've seen quite a dramatic reinvention of Kamala Harris. She wasn't considered a particularly capable VP. Now people are as excited about her, or, or the left-leaning media are at least, as they were about Barack Obama. What, what do you make of this transformation virtually overnight? Well, it, to me, it's kind of Hollywood. It's like a reinvention of her. Um, and I'm sure the Obama machine is behind this to make her look like a new attractive candidate. But um, where has she been the last three, four years? And what has she done? Uh, she has no record. In fact, the only responsibility, job responsibility she had was the border czar, uh, which she failed miserably. Yeah, and I think that issue in America is going to drive this election. And she's avoiding media interviews, of course? Of course. I think she's a little bit ahead in the poll, so why, why expose yourself? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, remember during COVID, Biden didn't really have to come out of the basement a whole lot. So we had the excuse <laughs> of the pandemic. That excuse isn't, isn't there now. That's right. That's right. And she should. I just want to ask you about the Israel-Hamas war. Are you concerned that we have seen this reluctance by the United States to wholeheartedly support Israel? You know, I mentioned uh, Biden's refusal to hand over some weapons. Israel is under threat on, on all sides. Uh, yes, Iran's behind it, but Hezbollah, um, Hamas, the Houthi rebels. Do you think the U.S. should be stronger in its support of its closest ally in the Middle East? Yeah, I've always felt that way. I think this is not... You know, this is not just Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthi rebels. This is really a conflict, a fight between Iran and Israel. And any daylight between the United States, it, it, you know, Israel's greatest ally partner, um, exposes them uh, to the bigger threat. Uh, they've withheld, uh, my administration has withheld weapons. I sign off on all four military sales, including uh, the AUKUS sales here. Um, and they've held them up. They've stalled them. Uh, that's a dangerous signal to our allies. 
Um, and it worries me. And I think there's a narrative out there. Um, if you look at the younger generation, the only news they have is primarily TikTok, which we know is driven by algorithms. They're driven by China, Russia, and Iran. So all they see is, is the Palestinian plight. Now, I'm very empathetic to them, um, but we need to finish this and move on to the normalization. Any talks of ceasefire, while it sounds great, it, it remains, a, it keeps Sinwar in power, Hamas in power, and this cannot, uh, this cannot be finalized until Hamas is out of power. We need a, there needs to be a new governing body in Gaza to 100%. move forward for the war to end. For the Palestinians. I've talked to the uh, Saudis very extensively about this. Uh, they're in the best position to form a, a governance for the Palestinians, but we can't get to the normalization. You've spoken to them about a, a helping with the process after the war. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. They are very engaged. They're keenly interested. They want to be a part of a new Middle East, a normalization that involves a reconstruction that they would, in most part, fund, but also, most importantly, a security alliance between the United States, Israel, and the Saudis. But we haven't seen anything like this. Well, the Abraham Accords were a big step forward. Mm. Uh, Jordan and Egypt, uh, very courageous. But this would be a game changer in the Middle East that could finally being, bring peace. But we can't get to that point, Sherry, until Hamas is is over. The parallels between the late 1930s and today are very uh, real. Um, history does repeat itself, and I don't want it to repeat itself in the Pacific. Do you mean in terms of anti-Semitism or global volatility it's repeating itself? I think in terms of a world war. Um, you know, we haven't seen a threat to Europe this size since World War II. Um, even according to your D Director of National Intelligence, we haven't seen a threat like this to the Pacific since World War II. And now we have the Middle East on fire uh, with the Ayatollah. And you know? Iran is clearly emboldened. Oh, 100%. They're, because of Afghanistan, because of the failures to put sanctions on China, who have revitalized the Russian military, when they see weakness, our enemies uh, become empowered. And they feel emboldened right now. And that's why President Xi is being so aggressive. He's emboldened. I asked uh, President Marcos in the Philippines, why do you think he's doing this? <clears throat> because he feels emboldened now. And it's because we're not projecting power and strength, uh, rather weakness. And historically, Chamberlain did this with Hitler. Hitler laughed at him, said it wasn't worth the paper was written on. Churchill came in, appeasement doesn't work. Churchill projected power. Churchill told my president at that time, Roosevelt, that it was the unnecessary war because it could have been prevented earlier on. That's why I'm here to provide deterrence to communist China. Michael McCall, a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thank you. All right. And that was U.S. Congressman Michael McCall.